Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, technology. and particularly the bit in between. Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, and particularly the bit in between. With your host, Barry Kirby. All right, welcome to this episode of the 1202 Human Factors Podcast. And I'm delighted to be able to say that this is coming to you today from the UK Space Agency. And I'd like to introduce um, our guest today, who is Susan Buckle. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Um, Susan's, Susan has um, quite, quite kindly agreed to have a chat to us about her role in the currently in the UK Space Agency, but also her career, um, which is absolutely fascinating. So if we start from the top, Susan, what does the Education Outreach Manager actually do? Okay, so we uh, fund and help coordinate and manage organisations within the education and the space sector to do amazing education resources or workshops or do outreach um, either at schools, which we call formal education. Um, so making sure the resources go into the, you know, build into the curriculum, um, which could be in the kind of traditional STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and maths. Obviously, it's all about STEAM as well. Mm. So you've got your arts in there as well. So we have actually done resources that are more to do with literacy or filmmaking or things like that. But to get the space element in there. Um, and then the other side is the more informal education and outreach. So, again, we work with the science centres across the UK, for example, um, and we'll do you know, more outreach and workshops for families and the general public as well. So Cool. Yeah. So some people will be wondering why me doing a human factors podcast is talking to an education outreach manager. But actually, your background is in, in, is in human factors, isn't it, in psychology? So yeah. um, where did it all begin? begin for you? <laughs> so um, I actually... Uh, got my private pilot's license when I was 17. Um, so I guess you could say, oh, it probably even started before that. So I was always... So that doesn't just walk up in the <laughs> yeah, post, does yeah. it? But, uh... um, so, yeah, I'm trying to wrap my brains now. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm one of three girls and my two sisters were always interested in horse riding and I okay. wasn't. Um, but luckily my dad um, flew, so uh, he used to take me up um, flying and that got me interested in the air cadets. So when I was 13... I joined the Air Cadets and I absolutely loved it. It was one thing I really stuck at, unlike musical instruments or horse riding or anything else that my parents were paying for. Um, so I absolutely loved that and used to go up in the Bulldog and do aerobatics and all that kind of thing. Oh, so yeah, really enjoyed that. And as I said, then I was lucky enough when I was 17 to get my private pilot's licence whilst I was still at school, uh, studying for my A-levels. Um, but one of the subjects that I studied at A-level was psychology. Um, so that I was going to go to university and read biology, but doing the psychology A-level absolutely interest, you know, fascinated oh, me. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so, and it had the biology and it had the maths and everything else, but it also had obviously all the psychology side of things. Yeah. So I uh, went to university to do psychology um, and actually came back to be a teacher okay. um, <clears throat> and trained to be a teacher whilst teaching full time um, at a further education college. And then whilst I was there, I saw the Masters at Cranfield University for Human Factors right, yeah. and Safety in Aeronautics. And it was just the perfect combination yes. of my, my two interests. So, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, yes, I guess um, we were saying just before we started that um, um, we both got Cranfield in common because mm -hmm. I went to Cran I did the whole Cranfield thing, but I did command and control systems, which mm -hmm. in hindsight, yours was way more interesting. Um, so, um, obviously, so you've now you've got, now got your... Uh, masters, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and you presumably just twiddling your thumbs, potentially looking at, <laughs> looking at that, um, that that job in in fast food retail. And uh, where, <laughs> where did you go from there? Yeah, so I think, oh gosh, I was about 25, 26, and obviously looking around um, for um, jobs and that. And actually, it was a, a temporary job came up with CCD um, oh, Design yeah. and Ergonomics, who I know you interviewed them yes. before Christmas. So I had six months with them um, on a project working with the Highways Agency. Okay. Uh, really, really enjoyed it, kind of, again, looking at crew resource management and that type of thing. But I guess because of the Masters in Aviation and my background, I always thought oh, I, I'd end up doing, you know, something in the aviation industry. It would seem crew, logical. Yes, yes. <laughs> crew resource management or you know, maybe cockpit design or something, you know, that we'd learn at Cranfield. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I was thinking I'd be going. And then um, whilst, so, yeah, then I saw this um, job come up at, at Cranfield, um, you know, on their um, careers, you know, yeah. advice and all the rest of it to work for the European Space Agency, 
training astronauts in human behavior and performance. Wow. And I looked at it and I thought, that is cool. I will never, ever, ever get that job. Um, but it was just the coolest job. And I kind of looked at it and I obviously spoke to my family about it. And they're like, yeah, you've got to do it anyway. And actually, when I read the job description, it was about 10 pages long. Wow. Of all the skills and qualifications and experience you needed. And I thought, you know what, unless you've had 10 or 15 years actually doing this job, yeah. you would never have all this. So I've got as good a chance as any. Um, so I applied for that. And um, I can't remember now. I think I got, I might have had a telephone interview because it was based in Germany. And um, they were like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. And then a couple of months later, they phoned me up and said, are you still interested? Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. And I said, yes. And my um, time at CCD was just finishing. And they said, OK, great. We'd like you to come, you know, just for six months probation and give it a go. We'll give you plenty of time to relocate and move and get used to it and everything. Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, and then the next call I had was, oh, could you start next week? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it was just really good timing. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I love the job at CCD. And if they'd have offered me something permanent I, and I didn't have the ESA opportunity, I might have gone for it. Um, but yeah, so I was like, oh, OK. And I was yeah, young and single and foolish. I don't know if I'd do it now, but it was, uh, yeah, well, I would actually. It, it was a really incredible opportunity. Yeah. So. But that's a, a really good point, actually, because there is a lot of talk around the differences, differences between... Um, almost men and women in the workplace and how you get the opportunities. And there's been a fair bit of research done that sort of says that um, men will, you know, if they see an opportunity, they'll, they'll just apply for it. And then if it's got loads of um, requirements and stuff, well, we'll, we'll blag it at some yeah. point. And I've made an entire career on that, so that, that works for me. Um, but it's, um, having done a lot of work with, with sort of um, women in STEM, they, you will sit down there and say, well, do I tick every box? And do I tick it well enough? And, yeah. and actually that, what you said is really, really um, encouraging that actually just do it. Yeah. and follow the dream and then then make the rest of it up afterwards yeah. um so in my job now pay. yeah we do um so i mainly deal with sort of under 16 year olds in terms okay. of the formal and informal education um and it's just a small team of us but there's a lady kathy bowden and she's incredible she's our careers um late and skills um she looks at and so she's looking exactly that and how to encourage women into it and sort of the language used in job adverts and just you know the criteria and you know all the things there and the potential barriers um, to try and break that down because exactly like you said I can't remember what the statistics are and most of them are made up on the spot so I could do that but um you know 42% there we go, we go. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah I mean as I said at that time I had a lot of encouragement from my family for sure um but I just thought well if you know why not <laughs> yeah yeah no, absolutely no that's really cool um so obviously that, that came up, but it, it, had it always been a um, hankering in your background to, to want to go and work in the space industry, or was it just a happy coincidence? Or? Um, so uh, yeah, as I said, I think I was definitely more interested in aviation, yeah. uh, and even like before all the psychology and everything, I thought I wanted to be a pilot, and because of the air cadets, I wanted to be the RAF, yeah. and you know, be a fighter pilot and all the rest of it, and then I was told... Um, which I'm sure they've changed now, but um, when I went and spoke to them, all my eyesight wasn't good enough, so they weren't interested. Um, right. And that was kind of, that just put me off. Um, so no, I kind of, that's where I thought I was heading. However, I was, like, we'd been, we were lucky when we were um, kids to go to Kennedy Space Centre, so I'd been, you know, around there and seen a rocket launch, oh, a shuttle fantastic. launch, yeah. um, which was incredible. So, and my dad's always been into it. So I kind of had that going on in the background, yeah. for sure. Uh, I wasn't not interested, um, but yeah, I definitely didn't think that's where I'd end up. And when <laughs> I had the, the week's notice from ESA to come and join them, I uh, yeah, sat down with my dad like, right, tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got to ESA then, what was um, with your week's notice yeah. and you just relocated? <laughs> what, what, what did they have you doing? Um, so the well, my job role there, so I, I, um, another big thing, and I don't know if it's just women, but was imposter syndrome. Yes. So I really okay. felt like I didn't know anything in there with these really intelligent, incredibly qualified, clever people um, working in the space industry. But, you know, what I had that they didn't was the background in psychology and human factors. Um, and that's what they were employing me to do. Yeah. So I was the human behavior and performance um, facilitator. So the main thing was training. Um, okay. So this was training the astronauts, but also everyone they worked with. So ground control and the instructors that taught them and everyone that, you know, kind of supported the astronauts. Because, you know, as you know, everyone kind of has to work together, don't yes. they? It's no yeah. point the astronauts having all this wonderful training if they're talking to ground control every day, you know, and it, it's not doing yeah. so. So with, 
so that's a massive remit. So mm. presumably there's, there's, you've got teams of teams of people working with you uh, for you and all that sort of stuff. Not really. <laughs> oh. It was me and my boss. <laughs> oh, okay. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, so she'd kind of. Uh, gone uh, on a similar human factors type course at NASA right. and then decided to bring it to the European Space Agency. So she was kind of the forerunner in that. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, and okay. then there was, there was me and there was another lady there at the time. And so we were doing the training there. Um, but yeah, it was a big undertaking. Oh, so that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. So presumably with that, yeah, there was a whole lot of, um, I guess, cultural education as well mm-hmm. as, as actually doing the actual training itself. Um, yeah. So did, were you be, basically being that human factors ambassador? Yes, um, yes. <laughs> so how did you see that change through your through your time there then? Were, yeah. were, did people buy into it more? Or? They did because definitely when I um, went there, because because I didn't know about the space um, industry and I didn't know, you know, how ESA worked or you know anything <laughs> much at all in terms of the industry and the context that I was working in. So I spent a lot of time like sitting in simulations, for example, yeah. um, and they, that was another actually one of my tasks was um looking at like observing human factors um during simulation training um, so this would be the ground control crew um training for simulations for this um international space station you know just general day-to-day stuff or if there's emergencies and things like that so um, obviously they do an awful awful lot of training um so i spent a lot of time in there and definitely there were you know without going into stereotypes there were certain people there that were like oh who's this young psychologist (laughs) coming in here is she what's she doing you know is she reading our body language is she reporting back on us and all that you know there was a real but it was more just um uh not ignorance but they just didn't understand or know what I was doing so it was an awful lot of explaining things and you know sitting quietly for a long time and observing and, and all the rest of it and then a case of you know slowly starting to talk to them and when they could see I could actually help them and all the problems all the problems but 90% of the problems they were having were human factors type issues Real, and you know yeah. getting the crew to work together and all the rest of it and they could see how I could help them um, then there was a lot of buy-in then so it took a while but yeah, <laughs> we yeah, got yeah. there oh, that's cool. so so then you go from um, uh, from your time there to to here yeah so yeah so I was there for about five years yeah and um then wanted to move back to the UK with family reasons and everything and um it was the most perfect opportunity that Tim Peake was just about to um go to, uh, to the International Space Station right. uh, yeah. on his Principia mission um and that he launched in December 2015 so I um started at the UK Space Agency <coughs> uh, October 2015. Oh, so straight Got into it there. Thrown into the deep end, yes. Obviously, the education I'm, team. I'm sensing a bit of a trend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the education team there had been obviously doing an awful lot of work for yeah. the previous three years or so preparing for his mission. Um, and actually, it was a um, colleague from ESA that um, was on the education team. So she was a flight director um, okay. at ESA. So, um, and yeah, she'd already come over to the UK a couple of years previous and had started education program so anyway there was yeah, a small team of us again um working together and we ended up um funding and project managing 36 um projects all oh, to wow. do with yeah. tim's principia mission um cool. all education if you are a human factors practitioner or in a related discipline and are not already a member then do look up the chartered institute of ergonomics and human factors They are the professional institution for all human factors practitioners. Find them at www.ergonomics.org.uk. Obviously, now you've been involved in basically, I guess you could argue it's predominantly been a man's world um, for, for for the space bit. Um, but I've read in some of the in some of the other interviews you've given that you've actually seen um, ESA and UK Space Agency is more of a it is more fifty yeah. fifty. Um, so how have, how have you found that being uh, well, being able to just you know, spread yeah. the good word about getting women into these type of roles? Yeah. So I I mean I talk about this a lot with colleagues and family and and my friends and everything um, because yes it is traditionally and it is still now there are more males in the STEM industry yes. and in the space industry and at ESA and everything else. However, for me, where I was based in Cologne in Germany was the Astronaut Centre. And I think it was about 50-50 of female, mainly instructors, um, and the um, crew support office, uh, medical crew support office was there as well. So there was a lot of females there. 
uh, my boss was female <laughs> when okay, I came yeah. over to the UK. Again, my immediate line manager was female. And in the UK space agency, um, I don't know the exact figures, but again, it's about 50-50. And so for me, I've never seen it as a barrier or, you know, I, I, I'm conscious of it. Yeah. Um, and I can go into meetings now and think it's full of men. Yeah. <laughs> but it's never been a barrier to me. Brilliant. And I okay. think I've always had very good role models as well. As I said, my, you know, my previous bosses, I think, have all been um, female. Now my line manager is male, but our director, international director, is an amazing lady. Um, so she's a really good role model as well. So that's, I've never kind of really seen good. it as a barrier to... So is, is there, a, I guess, a way we could try and use this almost a, as a wider case study? Because I've worked mm-hmm. in loads of different engineering. I mean, I think human factors is one of these things that there is a much better balance anyway. Yeah. Um, but when you're working in with different engineering organisations, they're still predominantly male. Mm. Um and for me, they've sort of learned two things. One is about HF and the other is about uh, about, about how to get the um, e- equality during them sort of yeah. roles. Um, so I think there's, there's perhaps a, a lot we could do there to use this as, almost as, as that case study. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we go, you know, the team goes in and talks a lot. You know, and I talked about Cathy as well, and, and she goes and gives lots of talks at universities and I do lots of school talks and everything to show, you know, young females that they, it's not a barrier and that they can do it and we um, you know also talk about job adverts and the language you use and you know even just when we're promoting it you know, even photos that we use to make yes. sure that they can see yeah. there's a balance and it, it's perfectly possible and you know we we try and think of what what are the barriers and the stereotypes is it that potentially it could be that you know females prefer working in teams and that's fine you think of a scientist or an engineer working solely by themselves and that's actually not the case yeah, especially in the space right. industry and, yeah. and human factors um, and I'm also on the board of the Women in Aerospace. Um, so we do, we had our meeting this morning, actually. Um, and, you know, we're always doing things to encourage females into the sector and, you know, being aware of unconscious biases mm-hmm. and all that mm-hmm. kind of thing, thing as well. So that's a right, lot that's... of people doing a lot of things, yes, desperately yeah. trying. <laughs> that's that's, that's um, really, really encouraging to hear, actually. So when you're looking at space travel um, and that whole space bit, I mean, if you haven't got it so far, I'm actually brim, brimming over with jealousy <laughs> because it's all—it's been uh, and people who've heard different uh, previous episodes, episodes of the podcast will know that uh, I have a massive space fixation. Um, Elon Musk does not respond to my tweets, which I find <laughs> most disappointing. Why? And, and the restraining order, I'm sure, is just just meant in a friendly manner. <laughs> but when you're looking at it, everyone thinks about it in terms of the equipment. You know, you see rockets going up and things like that, but there is a lot more to it, mm. and. Um, the pilot um, or the, the crew are obviously key elements of that, but there's also, as you mentioned earlier, there's all the support crew, there's the people who make everything happen in the first mm-hmm. place. So what do you see as those human challenges that, uh, when training for the space mission? Yeah. Um, what, what are the biggies? So when I was, um, again, back at ESA doing the training there, obviously we were training to go to the International Space Station, um, which is only 400 kilometres above Earth, and you can get back you know, within a couple of hours if there was an emergency. If we're talking about going to the moon, which ESA are talking about, and NASA, um, and then obviously further um, beyond to Mars, then you've got, um, you know, just the distance Mm -hmm. from Earth, from support, from, you know, that's, you know, there's lots of medical issues there as well, but whether that's that kind of support or what we're talking about, more likely kind of psychological support or just having your family there. Um, you know, and with the ISS, it orbits around the Earth and they can literally look out the window. Yes. Um, not that there's many there, but out the cupola and they can see Earth and kind of feel that connection. If you're talking about going to, you know, even to go to the moon or Mars, that psychological aspect of being further away and not having that connection um, is going to be a challenge. But then in terms of, um, you know, the crew that's going to go as well, you wouldn't want someone to go by themselves. So the crew is going to be really important. And it's not just the individuals in that crew and what their roles are and their skills and background, but obviously the big thing is how they get on together. Yes. So, mm. you know, the big thing is going to be selecting not just the individuals to be the best that you can get, but then the matrix of, you know, how the team's made up right. and yeah. how they're actually all going to get on and, um, you know, work together and with different skills but, you know, personalities as well that's going to come into it. So, See, one of the books I've, um, I say recently, but I've read it like hundreds and hundreds of times already, <laughs> is um, is The Martian. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I was really quite impressed with that because that does go into them mm. things quite a lot because they talk about the, uh, Mark, the guy, I want, no, no spoilers for you if you aren't ready, but he gets stuck on Mars. Um, <laughs> but they talk about how he fits into that team and what his part of it was. Yeah. Um, um, have you, I presume you... I, I have read it, but it yeah. is a while ago, I'll be honest. Yeah, so yeah. you have to remind but, me if there's something... The, um, um, 
so but that that, that whole scene how that mm. scene how that team works together he yeah. says so when you're um when you're looking at them, what, what sort of, I guess, what other psychological characteristics you're looking for? Yeah. Uh, do you think, or do you think are being looked for? Yeah. Um, what, what do they, what, what makes a good astronaut in, in, terms, of, <laughs> yeah. in terms of that respect, do you think? So I wasn't on the selection panel, um, but the astronauts, I mean, even now, just going to the ISS, they have a rigorous psychological and psychometric testing. Yeah. Um, and as I said, they're not just looking at individually how good they are. It is how they get on with other people. So... I mean, some of the training that we did, so we trained them in good communication, we trained them in good teamwork, situation awareness, all those kind of things. And so with the teamwork, again, you know, you'd um, teach them kind of the basic theory of it and give examples. We used to use a lot of aviation examples of accidents and things and, you know, how if they'd work to get better as a team. So just that general awareness. Um, And then we'd start, you know, doing lots of role plays and again, okay. doing computer simulations where they did have to go to Mars and that and seeing how they worked well together. Um, so in terms of selecting, you'd want to do that, obviously, on a much bigger scale. Um, but again, lots of simulations and training and seeing, you know, because, as you know, people will say things <laughs> that they should do and will do. Yes. Um, but actually seeing how they react and putting them in stressful situations. Um, so another thing um, that the... Um, that we were involved in at ESA was um, it's called caves. I can't remember what it stands for now, but they did. They used to go to Sardinia. The astronauts right. um, they used to go to Sardinia and go caving um, in quite kind of uh, remote, not dangerous, but you know, not <laughs> not your not average tourist cave. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they would do that. So we'd have the ESA astronauts, but they'd also have NASA astronauts, the Japanese, because that's a big thing as well. Um, you mentioned very briefly earlier about culture. There's you know yes. the general culture and safety culture and that, but generally um you know country culture as well and so we had yeah japanese canadian um and nasa astronauts and our east astronauts and russian um and they would all go and they'd have to do you know specific tasks in the caves and so it was a really good analogy um of if they'd have to go to mars obviously much smaller scale yeah, yeah, yeah. they were down yeah. there for five days but they'd have to survive together they'd have to you know nominate leaders and um, do quite you know specific tasks that were quite challenging um, and yeah, live and sleep and eat down there as well. Wow. So, so uh, I guess um, with my experience with working with um, with pilots and uh, generally very very qualified people for mm. what they're doing, ego plays quite a, <laughs> a large part. How, yeah. how does how do how does people's egos come across, and what what effect does that have? Yeah, I mean, so the, again, this is something I was really worried about when I was training them. I just thought, well, they're so clever and they've you know done these things, but actually. Um, they they are generally all trying to work to some kind of mission, mm. you know, and some of it at the moment with the ISS might be their specific science mission. Um, but a lot of it, you know, it's, you know, the ISS has to <laughs> operate and work and they have to do things together. So they really, you know, they know that all the other astronauts are just as qualified and just as deserving to be there. Um, so, you know, to keep the space station running, they all have to clean on a Saturday morning yeah, yeah, <laughs> because yeah, if, yeah. you know, dust and, you know, whatever particles get into the vents and that's a problem. So silly example, but, you know, ego doesn't come into it there. Yeah. They don't have a cleaner on the space station. They all have to kind of muck in. Um, so just, you know, things like that. And then bigger picture stuff, you know, if there was an emergency or anything, they know they have to work together if they're all going to survive or, you know, complete their science or whatever yes, it might be. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's cool. actually a lot. Lot less egotistical environment than you might expect. <laughs> so, so when you um, first joined the space agency, you were thrown into Tim Peake's mission. Yeah. Um, and obviously, at the time, Tim was everywhere yeah. doing everything. <laughs> yeah. So, what specifically was your role with him? What, yeah. what, what, what was your role? Um, so, as I said, myself and this um, Libby, a previous um, colleague at ESA, so we were managing um, the ed- uh, education resources and projects and everything there. And then before he um, was on the space station, which was in the December, and as I said, I joined October time. Um, then we did a few events with him, went to BBC and the rest of it. So I can't say it wasn't fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but kind of getting, you know, it was, it was also we, the education team worked a lot with our comms team as well. Yeah, so there okay. was a lot of that going on, um, which was really important to get him, you know, known and promote the education side of things that we were doing. Um, and then he was on the space station for six months. So mm-hmm. again, it was kind of 
really interesting managing, you know, him up on the, well, not managing him, but managing the education projects with him up on the space station and getting him to send down videos. Or yes. we had a few mm. like, um, it was Cosmic Classroom and um, amateur radio calls. So they were live I'd calls. Because he did, he did yeah. a lot of stuff where they where the, um, actually engaged with people live, <laughs> yeah. didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Which was amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was involved in a lot of those events. Obviously, I yeah. was down on the ground um, with the kids and everything. And then he was speaking to them from the space station. So I'd have to go in you know, to lots of schools and events and explain yeah. what was going on. And, and So you yeah. must have seen that direct, um, almost correlation between him actually doing all of that stuff and, pe- and young children being inspired. Yeah. Do you think you saw the um, young astronauts, the young flight directors, the young um, support workers? Oh, for absolutely. The yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, just anecdotally, yes, yeah, yeah. The, their faces and, you know, their comments and they were just absolutely amazed and couldn't believe it and, you know, and all the rest of it. And then this was our, our point with the UK Space Agency, obviously, to make it available to as many people and backgrounds and everything yeah. as possible. Mm-hmm. And all the competitions, as I said, with the radio contacts and everything were open to all the schools. So, you know, to see all these kids interested um, that may not have been before or may not have yeah. had much knowledge mm-hmm. about space or astronauts before was incredible. Um, and then we also did some more rigorous science um, and um, got some you know, research going as well to see people's um, you know, children's youngsters interest before, during and after his mission. Um, and so that kind of that longitudinal research was about three years. And then we keep right. talking about doing a follow up now. Oh, that's really um, cool. That, that was going to be one of, the, one of the questions is how, yeah. how, how obviously we, we are driven by cost and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. So some people will want to see return mm-hmm. on investment. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that has been yes, positively so, shown? Yes. Yeah. And we have to be really careful with that because, you know, the agency's money and yes. public money and all the rest of it. So, um, yes, we have to show that they that people are getting something out of it. I think we still got a couple of years to go because yeah, obviously yeah. it was only well, it'll be uh, four years um, this summer that he landed. So um, Gosh, some yeah. of those kids, <laughs> well, some of them will be going to university. So, yeah, we kind of would love to see that Apollo, you know, when the Apollo missions happened yes. and then all these students went on and, you know, did PhDs or whatever. So, um, you know, in an ideal world, that's what we do. But we've definitely already done some longitudinal research into it to show that it's been had a positive effect and cool. wait a couple more years and hopefully we'll see all those um, students going off to university and studying space engineering. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, I've got somebody, somebody from place now. Um, but for you, what was the most rewarding bit of being involved in the mission? What, what, oh, gosh. What, what do you remember most? Yeah. You can have more than one, yeah, that's fine. No, I, just everything, as I said, like we just talked about it, but just literally physically being there and seeing directly, you know, how the um, youngsters were responding to it and, you know, people coming up afterwards that had never, you know, even thought about it. You know, the same that I was when I was younger. I hadn't thought about having a career there and all that um, side of things. And I think one important thing, kind of going off your question a bit, but is that we are not trying to encourage everyone to be astronauts. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, we've had two British astronauts, obviously Helen Charman and Tim Peake. Um, we hope that we'll have many more, but we all those um, youngsters that we're exciting about the space industry, you know, it's to get them into the industry. It's a massive industry in the UK, and there's loads of scientists and engineers working on things all across the UK and working with ESA and, and NASA and everyone else, and that's only going to grow. So our, you know, idea is, and our hope is that, you know, kids will be passionate um, about the sector in general. And we'll go into those kind of jobs. So. And, it, and it seems to be a sector that really thrives off collaboration. Mm. And so it seems to be a really good example of um, being able to t- teach kids in particular that actually collaboration is a good thing. Yes. Um, which doesn't seem to be very popular. At the moment, so, <laughs> yeah. um, oh, but this is like absolutely necessary. I mean, as I said, we've got lots of British scientists and engineers working on things, but they are always working with you know, other space agencies across the world yeah. and, you know, other companies. And it's just, you know, the kind of technology that you need. You, you can't have one amazing innovator doing everything. It's just not yes. possible. Um, the, so when you were involved in that as well, obviously the, they used the Soyuz spacecraft. And, mm-hmm. and so there were, um, I remember reading somewhere that Tim had to do a whole lot of work um, actually learning all in Russian and yes. that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> Did you get involved in any of that sort of that? I guess look at the cultural side of things as as well as the um, just the, the straight educational at all. Uh, yeah, so in the when I was working at ESA, definitely that was really important, and we used to have other astronauts come, you know, all the time from the other space agency would, mm-hmm. would come and train. And um, one of the big things that I did in terms of my job with the human behaviour stuff was um, the Chinese. Um, right. We were looking at working with them at the time. And um, so we went over to Beijing and looked at the Chinese Space Agency and their training. And then they, two of their astronauts came to us and we did some training with our astronauts as well. 
Um, so there's always quite a big cultural aspect there. Um, but then in terms of the UK space agency and education, again, every time we give talks and we talk about collaboration, we are talking about collaborating, not just within the UK, but yeah. further afield. Um, and, you know, there's um, projects and things going on where they, you know, do talk to other agents, you know, a, a big um, one of the organisations we work with is called Ezero, which is the um, education office based up in York with STEM okay. learning. Yeah. But they're part of ESA as well. Um, so there's lots of ESA projects going on where the kids get to do all these things cool. together. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's uh, lots of things out fascinating. there. Fascinating. Yeah. This podcast is supported by K Sharp, the human science research and human factors consultancy. If you want to know how innovating in the relationship between humans and technology can add value to your business, product, or research, then visit www.ksharp.co.uk. So, obviously you talked about how the the mission was used about raising the profile of of, of STEM. Um, where Where do you think the future now is for that? Obviously, Tim's done his thing. Um, but like life goes on, like I said, that was for that was four years ago. So, what what's the what's the next big thing on the horizon? Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of Tim and astronauts, we hope he'll fly again. Um, the last, is, is yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. So the last Eastern Ministerial where they all the space agency get together and decide on funding and um, programs and everything. So. Um, the ESA, oh gosh, I shouldn't like it. ESA director said how they want all the current ESA astronaut corps to fly again by, I think, 2024, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, and uh, so obviously Tim will be one of them. And so, yeah, I mean, all the astronauts, because um, it takes such a long of time and money say, yes. to train them. Yes. Um, Massive investment. And, you know, so as long as they're still keen and fit and healthy, there's absolutely no reason why he shouldn't fly again. That's definitely the intention. Um, ESA are talking about putting another call out for astronauts as well. So, you know, cool. there's definitely a future in terms of astronauts in the ISS and us doing more education stuff in that way. Um, but since he landed, as I said, the UK's um, heavily involved in, or, you know, the space agency is heavily involved in looking at building spaceports in the UK, which would be really exciting. Um, so, again, all the kind of industry and technology mm-hmm. and stuff that's going to go into that. So, we've done some education programs. Um, around that ExoMars, so sending the next um, Mars rover, um, yeah, which hopefully we'll see will launch um, in July this year. Very um, exciting. Yeah, which will be really really exciting. Um, so we've done some lots of education around that, the James Webb um, Telescope, um, and uh, yeah, just lots of you know. There's, there's always new space some... missions going on, so it's just getting you know, kids uh, interested and excited about those as well. It's not all about astronauts. <laughs> no, exactly. It's it's is because actually there is lots of different companies in the UK doing different things, you know, around satellites mm. and, um, and 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 that type of thing. But what do you think the uh, the human factor challenges? Of, yeah. of, of, that are coming up are going to be? What what are we going to be seeing most of? Yeah. So I mean, actually, I was so I was just talking then about kind of missions out into space, mm-hmm. and obviously there's going to be challenges there with the technology and if you're working with astronauts but actually you just mentioned satellites so satellite applications is a big thing and earth observation you know climate change and the environment is a is a massive topic at the moment so there's you know hundreds of satellites orbiting around the earth measuring all these variables um and it's really a case we again talked about it a lot what sort of people do we want and it's uh, you know to work in the industry and it's not just the stereotypical maths scientists, you know, yeah. computer coders. But actually, if you think about Earth observation, um, you know, when I had, did a talk at my old school um, last week and a lot of them were geography students and they said, oh, okay. well, what's space got to do with us and what we're interested in? Actually, a lot. <laughs> 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 because you don't just need the people that can, you know, uh, code or whatever, get all the data from the satellites, that you need someone to be able to interpret it and understand it as well. So it's kind of the challenge there of, you know, the, the mix between the data and the technical side of things and, you know, the human side of things or the interpretation and yeah. analysis of these things. So that's really important. That's so exciting. <laughs> um, we touched briefly on on the, uh, the the future Mars exploration. Now, obviously, we've, we've seen that people have ambitions to colonise Mars mm-hmm. and, and things like that. Um, what do you think the um, the I guess the issues we would face in, in trying to do that now? Because obviously people are talking about doing it almost like the way people talk about doing it tomorrow. If I talk to my kids, <laughs> I'm going to go and do this tomorrow. Um, but you know, Elon Musk is clearly pushing things mm. like that forward with big ambitions. But it takes a bit more than just ambition to get there. Yeah. From our perspective, what do you think the biggest challenges are that we're going to hit trying to do that? 
to colonise Mars. Yeah. <laughs> or even just get just yeah. to get there and so we've yeah. got to put somebody on there. Yeah. And they're on about doing it by what, twenty thirty, twenty thirty five, things yeah. like that, which is very close. Yes. In terms of time scale. So so obviously there's all the technical side of things yeah. and actually having the, the technology to do that. And there's the financial side of things, which is why it's maybe easier for Elon Musk and, and those kind of people <laughs> to say that we can do it. The agencies, um, you know, our government are obviously talking about it as yeah. well. But um, there's you know issues there in terms of human factors and, um, and psychological aspects. I mean, that's why there's an awful lot of talk about if you went to Mars you know, would you come back again or should yeah. you stay and, you know, colonise it and, and build a life there? So there's a real, you know, psychological factor, not just, I mean, we talked earlier about getting there and mm. your team to get there, but once you're there, what do you do as well? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of psychological factors about <coughs> the environment there and how you'd live there, the lack of nature and, you know, people back home and, and all that yeah. kind of thing as well. So, and communication, you know, the time it takes send a message <laughs> it, it sounds a stupid thing to say but it's not until you actually see it compared to it. it's a really long way away yeah, I think is. we think that actually the moon is not far away because I think yeah. we're talking, but, but that's still very far away yeah, so, yeah. Um, and actually you know people like with the space station as I said it's 400 kilometres away when I used to teach also um, the or train the, uh, a crew that used to go to one of the Antarctic stations um, and actually, it was more remote and difficult to get to um, during winter time than the International Space Station because you couldn't fly in an aeroplane and go and rescue someone if there was a, a problem. Yeah. Um, whereas the space station, if there was a real issue, they could actually get back down to Earth within, I think it's six hours or so. Wow. Um, <laughs> so that kind of factor, even if it is just psychological, but it's not, you know, it, it, just to communicate a, a, an issue or just a, a message or anything, it's going to take you know, much longer, and then come back again, you, that's an hour just to send a message there and wow. back, so, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's going to be... It's going to be intense. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> well, Susan, thank you very much for hosting us today, and, and giving us a, an insight into either your background in space, which I'm still massively jealous of, but also, <laughs> I think it's really inspiring to hear that um, the work that you're doing um, to inspire the basically the, f- the future astronauts with the future um, supporting um, elements and the future engineers that will support all this sort of thing is 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 just brilliant. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, but back to you. What, what, what does your future look like? <laughs> Are you um, yeah. sort of talked about like you know if, if we've talked to other people in the past in, in interviews and said oh you know what what would be the job that you drop everything to go and do? I sort of sense the feeling that you might have already done it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, exactly, and I honestly, I, I, I can't think of anything that I'd rather do. Um, and I do remember when I was back at ESA, someone older than me said, "Well, you surely, you've, you know, I was only twenty six at the time," and someone <laughs> said, "Surely you've reached the pinnacle of your career now." And I thought, Thanks "Well, so. yeah, this is the coolest job." Like I've, I, I honestly haven't had the Sunday blues for like the last, you know, ten years or so um, since working in the industry. So. You know, I thought back then that that was the pinnacle. So yeah. who knows? I, you know, you never say never. And I, I'm quite ambitious and like to, you know, do different things. So I, I don't know what I, that I'd stay doing this forever, but definitely for the foreseeable future, because I'm genuinely interested and passionate about education. I'm mm-hmm. interested in what the next generation is going to do. And in the space industry that's changing, you know, all the time and new technologies and missions and everything, you know, it never gets boring. So I yeah, can't that's think of anything else I'd rather do. So we need to come back and say, a longitudinal study, come back in five years. Yes, and, and, and ask me at. then. But, uh, Susan, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human Factors podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us at www.barrykirby.co.uk and on Twitter at B-A-Z underscore K. See you next time. And remember, it's more than just common sense. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human the Factors, Factors Podcast. Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us on social media such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next See time. You next- and remember, it's more than just common sense.